Hello everyone, this is Alice with Extinction Rebellion. We're here outside the International Maritime Organization in London, ahead, one day ahead of talks that are going to be going ahead uh, with the Marine Environment Protection Committee. This takes place from tomorrow until the 20th November and the consequences could be absolutely catastrophic for the future of our planet. If you're tuning in today, um, it's quite a catchy word <laughs> or, or, um, or piece of proposal that's going ahead. It's j forward slash 5.rev.1. Um, we're going to be hearing about that a lot today. Do give it a look on the internet and you can find out a little bit about what this is. Um, and as you can see, it says Paris Climate Agreement here outside the IMO and it is in flames. That's because this proposal, if it goes ahead, it will completely flounder any possibility of meeting that Paris Climate Agreement. Now here outside the IMO, you can see there are a few people here, all socially distanced, of course. Um, and next to me, I have Andrew. Andrew, I was hoping you'd be able to talk to us today yeah, and just hi. tell us why we're here. I'm going to stand a little bit distant from you. You're on camera now. If you could explain why we're here today, that would be fantastic. Yeah, well, we're here again today, like four weeks from when we were last here, because the committee that was writing the proposals up to 2030 for all of shipping, uh, is meeting starting tomorrow morning for five days. So last time we were here, the committee was write, writing the proposal. This week, before council, will pass it. And the proposal is for no mandate, no um, obligatory measures, only mandate, uh, only voluntary measures for emissions cuts up to 2030. So basically, a free hit for shipping up to 2030, unless the council votes down the proposal this week. And the flag today is symbolising, obviously, as you've mentioned, shipping isn't in the Paris Agreement. So we can all turn off our lights and turn down our thermostats and whatever, but shipping, which if it were a country is the sixth biggest emitter in the world, has a free pass up to 2030. Act now guys, I mean, oh, anyway, it's beyond depressing. For so many people this won't be, shipping is something that a lot of people just don't have their finger on the pulse of uh -huh. at all. Where would you point people to find out about this? Because for so many people now, they'll be looking at this being like, we're on earth, you're in front of a big ship in London. What's right, the relevance sure, to us? For sure. Well, I mean, start with, start with the Ocean Rebellion website. Ocean Rebellion is a, uh, a movement of various NGOs and activists who are interested in taking action. And we particularly focus on the International Maritime Organization because this is the UN, right? This is the only bit of the UN that's based in London. And these are the only people who govern the international waters, the waters that aren't inshore, that belong to crown states. So like the high seas, they effectively govern that on all of our behalf, on the planet's behalf. And to be honest, they're exploiting it in grotesque ways. This lot are talking about auctioning off the seabed for mining of precious metals, right? The seabed belongs to no one, it's commons, and it's now going to be auctioned off, right? Uh, I cannot believe, I've learned a lot here, and I cannot believe how tied up the UN is with big business and big politics. It's and, disgraceful. And can you tell me why this, this meeting in particular is so important? What, what is the consequences for the planet if it goes well, away if it, Yeah, from exactly. What well, we if, want? If, if, if the UN allows shipping a free pass with no emissions counted or reduced to 2030, I, some estimates say that all of our carbon budget to 2030 will be used up by shipping if shipping has a free hit. Right. It doesn't matter what any nation does, that's all of the available carbon to live with in a de degree and a half. So it happens right here. And I have one last thing to mention here. We're outside the International Maritime Organization, of course, which I've got the definition here. So it's supposed to be a specialized agency responsible for the safety and environmental regulation of international mm. shipping. Are they doing their job, in your opinion? Oh, oh no way, no way. The, it, it's not clear. They have no plans for reducing emissions, right? So th that is their primary task. But there's also a whole load of other stuff they're doing about heavy fuel oil. You know, the, let me just tell you that the oil that is burned in a boat is the bottom of the barrel. It's the bottom of the oil industry. And if it were not burned by shipping, it cannot be burned anywhere else. The oil industry would have to pay to dispose safely of that. It's like radioactive waste, right? Ship the oil industry cannot cope with its own waste. So it sells the oil to shipping to burn or dump in the Arctic. Right, so it's this is this is out of control. Somebody's got to get on this now. Absolutely, right? that's what we're doing. Thank you very much, Kyle. Uh
Andrew, that's fantastic. Now, as you can see here, we've got the Paris Climate Agreement going up in flames. That is a very real statement here showing exactly what will happen if these conversations over the next few days um, don't go in the favour of the planet. This is a really, really big problem, everybody. If you're watching here and you're wondering just how big is this problem and why are we fighting it in England? Well, it's not just in England this is relevant. This is relevant all over the world. There are activists fighting um, these horrendous ecological or ecologically damaging policies um, and this one can be prevented if enough attention is put on it. So if you're watching this today, please share this video with at least five other people, um, ideally not part of Extinction Rebellion, obviously also there if they can send that video on to five other people as well, that's fantastic. We want to get the message out there about this incredibly damaging proposal and the consequences it can have. What kind of consequences can it have? Well, let's go right now. Uh, right now we're going to go over to a country really fighting this um, from the very, very front of the battle. That is the people over in Mauritius, um, where only a few months ago they were experiencing a absolutely catastrophic oil spill that's causing devastation in that country and across the coast. This is huge. We're going to pass over now um, to our friends, our activists in Mauritius, who are able to give some light into what it's like living in an area where these sorts of regulations that we currently have, without even considering these damaging proposals, are having such a damaging impact. So we're going to pass over now to Stefan Gua, who's over in Mauritius. Hi, I am uh, Stefan Guya uh, from Mauritius, an uh, artist, uh, political and ecological uh, activist from the organization Resistance et Alternative, which uh, has been much uh, active in the people's mobilization that took place in Mauritius uh, from the beginning of August when we had the Wakasho oil spillage in the south southern part of the of the uh, island. Uh, I think that we've all been traumatized in a way or another with, with what uh, happened in uh, August when we had the oil spillage because no one ever thought of our sea, our lagoon, as being different as how it is uh, today and seeing like the oil being spoiled like that into 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 uh, our sea and our water uh, has been highly uh, trauma traumatizing for many uh, people and I think that there's also a sense of revolt amongst uh, many people in the sense that uh, no one asked for that in Mauritius and I think this uh, is the whole question that we need to reflect about today especially for insular state is how our maritime zone, how our uh, uh, natural habitat is being used uh, in, a, in a way that uh, is posing a threat to life and ecosystem and livelihood of, uh, of people. And I think this is uh, critical uh, uh, today. There's a, a visible uh, aspect and there's a non-visible uh, aspect. And I think that the most uh, visible one has been the the site of the stranded Electra dolphins uh, that came to uh, die uh, ashore on the southern east part of the of the uh, island. And uh, what is still visible today uh, is uh, the different mangroves of the coastal region from that part of the of the country that are still being uh, clean today because uh, this is where. We can see uh, uh, traces of the of the oil spillage that occurred in, in Mauritius, but I think that there's all that is uh, non-visible uh, is uh, all that's beneath our our feet and uh, beneath the the sea itself, because we don't know how the nanoparticles of uh, of the oil spillage were, went uh, into what's beneath, and uh, and it's difficult for for us citizens, social movements, ecologists to have an uh, independent assessment of uh, what uh, the, what are the ecological cost and impact of what happened. Those countries like Mauritius, they are signing a lot of conventions, a lot of agreements that has to do with their maritime zone, with the sea. Might it be fishing agreements or other kind of, of uh, agreements that uh, gives uh, the right to many of the northern countries, uh, amongst others, 
to to use those maritime uh, zone but the, the use of those maritime zone are not always being done in a proper way because it is uh, dependent on, on kind of I would say destructive activities might it be industrial fishing or being the uh, convey of, uh, of um, hazardous products like uh, we've seen for the workers and uh, when we are having kind of uh, uh, accident or catastrophe like we've seen in the case of the worker show we just realize how uh, there's an imbalance in uh, decision taking regarding the use of the, those maritime zones because uh, insular states like Mauritius they don't have the means in responding rightfully to, to those kinds of, uh, of uh, catastrophe. But there's an, an imbalance in the decision taking while uh, signing conventions and taking the decisions because uh, we all know that uh, the major decisions they are being uh, already taken might it be in, in uh, like corporate boardrooms or uh, in big uh, institutions and uh, when countries like Mauritius they are signing they are barely not being part of those uh, kind of, uh, of uh, decisions. If we take the example of uh, Mauritius as an insular state, uh, uh, its contribution to the emission of CO2 is of 0.01%, but yet it has been ra uh, ranked in 2018 as the 16th country being uh, more at risk uh, in the crisis that we are in uh, today. And uh, I think that uh, we all know today that uh, the, the, this deep ecological and climate crisis has to do with the fossil fuel industries, has to do with the extractivist uh, 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 activities that are mostly being uh, done uh, in, in, in southern and global south, but done by uh, uh, corporates that are found in uh, what we call the global, global north. People in boardrooms of big corporations, people in uh, in, in big uh, financial institutions, in uh, worldwide uh, institutions taking uh, major decisions, need to realize that whatever they say, whatever they sign, whatever they do, impact in reality people's life. Collective ownership of the means of production, collective ownership of decision making, and uh, getting people together to work to work towards uh, something that has a positive impact on our natural habitat, on, uh, on the society. This is what actually brings real progress. So I would like to, to, to thank all the activists uh, from any part of the world that are uh, moving, that are uh, 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 demonstrating, that are on the streets uh, for, for things to be changed, because uh, things won't change in, in, in boardrooms. Things will change in reality when we change the balance of power between uh, those corporations and those taking the ill decisions for our planet uh, uh, and the people that are really struggling, that are really on the forefront of the, of the major crisis today. So, thank you. Hello everyone, if you're just tuning in now, we are inside London, outside the IMO, the International, International Maritime Organization, the group responsible for changing the tide on the future of our ecosystems, really, when it comes down to it, um, according to what will happen in meetings that are going ahead tomorrow and until the 20th. This is a huge, huge deal, as you can see behind or in front of me here, we've got a, uh, a recently burnt flag saying Paris Climate Agreement, really a testament to what's going on if these talks go to plan and these proposals are adopted, the Paris Climate Agreement will not be possible to meet. And I've got an interviewee here, um, the person who actually owns this wonderful fish factory behind us, which is fantastic. This is Rob. Rob, are you able to introduce yourself to me? Hi, I'm Rob Hicks. I'm the maker of Mechanical Contraptions and working with Ocean Rebellion at the moment, trying to raise public awareness about the crisis in our seas, high seas particularly. Now, this situation, I'll just come back to what you said about not meeting the Paris. They've already agreed. We don't need to meet. They have no intention whatsoever to meet the Paris Climate Agreement already. That's, they were already there. Now, what they were going to do was to implement some plans that if you imagine a graph here's their growth trajectory of the shipping industry if they did everything they were going to do it was going to knock two percent off their growth not their reduction that they need to do in order to save us all but off their growth now what they did two weeks ago when we were here last is they've agreed that that two percent 
is in a document that they're now approving that means that they don't even need to meet it because the fuel lobby, the lobby and the shipping lobby have got involved and they've taken all the teeth away. So the, the document is unimplementable. There's no need for anyone to actually meet the requirements. The requirements are shit and now they've taken away any teeth to actually legislate that even the requirements need not be met. You just say, oh, I'm non-compliant in 10 years' time. You can approve yourself as a non-compliant ship and continue business as usual. So that's what the IMO have done. Now they're taking it to the MEPC, the Marine Environmental Protection Committee, which again sounds like a really good name, but that's also probably going to approve it unless we can kick off and put enough pressure and if everyone says, we're not having this. So this is why we're here today, is to put pressure on the IMO and the MEPC to say we're watching you, you cannot approve such a woefully awful deal. So that's, that's the basic gist of where our problems lie. And I think it's really apt then, as we're talking about this, the emergency services just move past because this is really an emergency, which is uh, really not yeah. being taken seriously, as you said, yeah. from, from what you were just mentioning there. We just came from an interview with Stefan Gua, who is in Mauritius, and he was explaining how all horrifying it was to find um, dead animals, dead, uh, like, human livelihoods completely destroyed, seeing this on a much more acute yeah. level than maybe a lot of people here in London feel. Yeah. You actually come from the coast in Cornwall, is that right? Yeah. Um, how does, how, why is all of this so sensitive to you? How, how do you feel like you can make people at home recognise that this isn't simply a case of a Wakashio oil spill that's so horrific over in Mauritius or the other nine oil spills that have happened this year alone or the other, the, the people who are at the forefront that, that you can't particularly see suffering yeah. from all the damage of the climate crisis first, yeah. first hand. How, how can you push that idea of like the emergency really, the, the need for this recognition of bodies like this having such yeah. an impact? I think, I think that's a really good question. I think the problem, my hope is that if the general public understands that they have rightfully trust in a body like the UN, or the IMO is basically the UN for shipping. Now it's not unreasonable for us to trust that they had due process, that there was an independent autonomous organisation not controlled by the industry itself. So if we can explain to people why that's not the case, then there can be the public consensus which puts the pressure, which gives the politicians the mandate to act. Now. So explaining why the IMO is under the control of big business I think is really useful. And then it's, it, uh, I heard it beautifully explained by, basically the IMO is funded by the, the more ships you have, the more say you have in the organisation. Which sort of makes sense on a basic common sense point of view. The club with the people, so, but the problem is the, ship, the country with the most ships in the world, by far, something like two thirds of the entire global fleet, is Panama. And the reason Panama... How many do they have, sorry? Pardon? How many does Panama have? I believe it's about two-thirds of the global fleet of shipping fly something called a flag of convenience at the Panama. They're not owned by Panamanians. They're owned by US, Chinese, everyone else. But you register your boat to be owned by Panama and you give them a, a load of thousands of pounds. And the reason you do that is because Panama pays no tax and you have almost no environmental legislation and almost no employment law. Now, as a result of them being this easy route, basically a loophole they've set up, like Monaco, like any other tax avoidance thing, but also environmental avoidance, employment avoidance, then you sit back and go, well, who should run the IMO? It's whoever's got the most ships and the most money in the industry. So the Panamanians run and control the IMO, set to legislate, but the only reason that they're running it is because they've already self-confessed we have no legislation come to us. So it's a classic case of, oh, for fuck's sake. Mm. What, you know, just the usual it's exacerbated, neoliberalism really, it? in all of its finest examples. This is what happens. So now they make the rules and then they get it approved by the MEPC, which is just as toothless and the same situation occurring where the power and the legislation is held by the countries that have the biggest vested interest. So that's where I do believe that, myself included, understand that going, holy shit, I thought that I could trust the UN on things. But there isn't one. That's why shipping isn't included globally on any nation's emissions. That's the same as aviation. The fact that shipping and aviation are excluded 
says all you need to know. How can they just opt out? It's again like having a diet to say, but I'm not going to include cake in the diet because if I include cake and sugar in my diet, then my diet doesn't look good. So, which is much the same, you know. So, so that's the problem, and, and also the solution I think still comes from educating the masses until because the, the masses would agree that is totally unacceptable, but the masses don't. I didn't know that very thing about Panama. Why is Panama in control of it until last week? Thanks to listening to the beautiful, informative press releases and the, our advisors, this is NGO Transport and Environment, who are NGOs sitting in the conference right now, trying to lever change, hopefully. There's a lot of big words, a lot of big uh, sort of distance there. There's so many larger groups and organizations involved in it. It's quite hard to understand the human side of this. Yeah. Could you speak to that at all, as somebody who lives on the coast, as somebody who's more yeah, knowledgeable I mean, about this fairly recently, from what I understand? On an absolute basic thing, I live on a little fishing boat down in Falmouth. Um, if I go, it used to be the mackerel would come in every year. These were sort of ceremonies that, I've only been there 20 years, you know, this is like a drop in the ocean. I grew up in the Midlands, came down there, we'd set every summer, the Baskin sharks would come around at some point, we'd all row out and just see the Baskin sharks, then mackerel on the barbecue That's on the amazing. beach. That was the sort of lifestyle. It's not anymore. The last four or five years, the Gulf Stream's changed, the, the Baskin Sharks don't come anymore, the mackerel are hardly there anymore. If you go out, if you can get five or ten, it used to be you just stop. It was just like five and a half, five and a half, whatever. Now, so even in my tiny snippet of my own, yeah, I can see huge degradation. And also in Falmouth and the surrounding area, the, just the, the development, the UK style development of all these little sanctuaries, they're all little creeks and the, where all the wrecks and wherever else, the real habitat, just they have been developed as we, you know, as we end up just with anything, tourism coming down, let's clean up that area, let's tidy that, let's just remove those communities there and yeah, so it's really sad on a personal level but that I think is a drop in the ocean compared to the broader picture if you look into like pelagic shipping trawlers and the, the deeper seas and the mining, so it's a, that's more yeah, so I can see the parallels, but I know that what I'm seeing is a tiny screwed down version of like what Mauritanians are seeing, for example, Mauritians. 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 <laughs> Mauritians, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think it's still incredibly valuable. I have to ask the question, what message would you have for anyone watching this? And what would be the one take home that you would tell anyone watching this for the first time? I don't know. You asked me this last time, I didn't know yeah. the answer. I mean, for me, it's get involved. Absolutely, don't sit back and expect that this situation is going to get solved by writing to MP. You need revolution, we need systemic change, you need to get out, you need to be activists, you need to start really pushing whatever that agenda can be. Look up Ocean Rebellion, look up any of these things, just work out how you can get involved and get out there, not expecting that maybe a collectivism here or a letter here is going to change anything. Absolutely. And become educated, look at the research and make your own opinions and see in what way you can act. Like, for me it was a real struggle, I make mechanical sculptures, I was sort of making them for the film and the arts and sort of theatre industry, thinking how can my skills be useful and it's like find a way where the, in order to have a long term sustainable activist and thing, I think you need to find your specific skill set and then work out a way that that can be creative and yeah and sustainable for your own lifestyle long term so you can find a niche, so I'd say that would be find what you're good at and work out, so if you're a cellist, whatever you know what I mean, where can I play the cello? Absolutely. Or if I'm, uh, an accountant, hell yeah, where can I study money streams, point actions and advise other actors on the insurance industry, which is the other big thing that funds all of this. If we can then tackle without insurance for these big build projects, nothing happens. So whatever area that you work in in life, however much you think, oh, you know, what, how can accountant change it? No, absolutely. We've all got our niches. Look at your own industry find where the power lies and where the corruption is and work out who, if you don't have a creative way to bring that to people's opinions, then liaise with Extinction Rebellion, Ocean Rebellion, people who will then manage to point point the, um, the media in that direction and from that point in the media comes the public awareness, comes the political pressure, comes not just the pressure on the politicians to look good, but the mandate that allows, if they do make the decision, they know they're not going to get chastised for it because they know they've actually got the public behind them but right now they don't you know the politicians are just like anyone else they're insecure of their job situation they don't want to be saying well I'm going to press radical thing I'm going to get shot down but if they know everyone's banging at their doors going bloody hell do something about 
um, international shipping. They're like, oh, I, I didn't realise any of you cared, because they didn't. So bring that into the public arena. Keep pushing stuff that way. Thank you so much for talking to, to us, Rob. We're now going to pass over to Jules, who is going to be speaking to Sophie, one of the people involved in this action as well. Thank you very much, Rob. Pleasure. That's amazing. Please get involved and share this video if you can. You're now with Jules and Sophie. Here we are in the afternoon, the afternoon, number for Albert and Duncan, Duncan, in front of the International Maritime Organization. And here we are, somewhere, somewhere in Sorry, sorry. I'm from Ocean Rebellion. Okay, and what's your organization about? Okay, and, and why and why why are you here today on this day? We're here today because it's happening in London in London and you can see it and it starts tomorrow and basically a paper a paper which is a paper which will basically allow shipping emissions to increase rather than decrease. So we decided to protest today because it probably starts tomorrow. Great, I see that there's a... I can see that there's something that says Paris That's Climate right. Agreement. Yeah, because the it's passed and shipping emissions did. It's basically sending Paris Climate Agreement up in the smoke. It's sending it up, sending it up in smoke. So, and who is adding to, adding to send up the Paris Agreement up in smoke? Great, so it's the international. And the understanding is that these delegates are representative of trees who put a flag on, flag on ships, even if ships don't, don't belong to that country. So that would be the flags of convenient countries. Seems that it seems that it's a it's an organization that is well highly influenced by lobbyists vested interests because if they, if they are aiming to lower emissions but they are doing emission to increase increase that has a say that I guess oil companies uh, I heard that eighty percent of trade happens over the oceans. So it's anything that we can that comes from comes from overseas. I hear that in lots of the cal so the calculation for the par for the Paris avi aviation is, in is included. So even though countries will fill their mouth saying that they're saying that they're reducing their, but they're not counting what is what is produced abroad but consumed consume within the borders. And what? Why is this so scary? Why? This sounds a bit obscure. Why is it? Why is it so scary? Too, too scary to people. Just too scary. To just, scary. just scary that if the IMO is con is allowed to continue on that path, the consequences that that will have, not only for us humans, but for life on Earth. Scientists like Kevin Anderson have been saying that that four degrees means a collapse of civilization. More, yeah, more than that, it means acidification of the oceans. When the oceans acidify, then the weather stops being. So we're, we're getting a bit technical here. Acidification yeah, means that CO2 is absorbed by the ocean. So basically, all our fossil fuel emissions, they are either liberated into the atmosphere or absorbed by the ocean. And when the ocean absorbs CO2, it becomes acidic. And that doesn't allow life to thrive. To give you an idea, the Great Dying, which was on the border of the Permian Triassic, so many millions of years ago, that mass extinction that ended up, I think, in over 90% of species being wiped out, 
had a main culprit of the oceans being acidified. So it is crazy that the science is telling us that we are headed for collective human suicide and just because some want to profit a bit yeah. or a lot yeah. and maintain positions of power they're willing to take us to billions of humans dying basically and the six mass extinction yes and is this within our within our lives the point is, I think, with all of this is nobody really knows because when you start including tipping points like the permafrost melting and the methane escaping and, and um, yeah, you people have no idea. They don't know how fast these things are, uh, are going to happen. So. During, during the recent rebellion here in London, there was lots of talk of, of the albedo effect disappearing. Yes, of course, the albedo effect. With the can, you, can you explain to us a little bit about that? I'm not a scientist, I'm an artist, but the albedo effect is basically the, um, so um, white reflects light, reflects light. light and heat. So when the, um, in the ice shelf with um, carbon falling into the ice shelf and it gets darker and dirtier, it heats quicker. So that's the albedo effect. As so it doesn't as reflect the light and it gets a bit warmer. And it, but then it gets warmer because it's getting warmer and dirtier and warmer and dirtier and the white is, is disappearing. So with the Arctic ice shelves disappearing, um, the sea is dark, so the sea gets warmer and the ice melts faster. It's a, a feedback loop. So it's not, it, it's not a nice experiment that we're playing it's with our planet. It's definitely not a nice experiment that we're doing with the planet and it's one which, like the albedo effect, once it starts, you can't stop it. Okay, it gets, so things get hotter and hotter. Narrowing it down, what are the demands of the Ocean Rebellion and what would you tell people that are watching this live stream? What can they do to put pressure on these governments, on these institutions of the United Nations that have a human rights declaration? I think in December they're going to celebrate it on, on the 10th and it talks about the right to life, the, life, the right to water, education, like all those things are going to disappear. Like the climate crisis and the ecological crisis is a human rights crisis. Absolutely, yeah. And people on the front line of this are, are the people in um, in the, the global south. I mean, they're suffering, like there's, there's lots of there's low-lying islands like um, the Maldives that are going to disappear. These people are, are it's a human rights issue. We're here just kind of relatively safe. But there's people who are, are really suffering now, people in Bangladesh and um, all over the globe. So Pan Panama has the highest number of delegates because it has a number, the highest number of flags of convenience. It already has some islands where people have had to leave. Yeah. The Kuna indigenous that in fact gave name before their Christopher Columbus arrived to the Americas, to that part of the world as Abjajala their way of life is being totally annihilated because they need to leave their islands, their corals are destroyed, it doesn't help them with all the big storms that are coming up, flooding, it's quite insane to see fellow brothers and sisters, people just like, like us right here, already having to lose their home. Absolutely, it's terrible, so, it needs to stop. then we should use it and we feel that's why we're here today despite everything to use our voices to, to do what we can for ourselves for our children for the next seven generations and for people who are in the in the position of suffering for this right now okay well great is there anything else that you'd like to say that before we continue um seeing what's happening around here um I think it would be very good if people looked on the Ocean Rebellion website and maybe sign up. What's that website? It's oceanrebellion.org mm -hmm. and um, sign up and really just take time to uh, care about the seas, I guess. It's, it's not an abstract thing that you just go and visit on holiday. This is where our weather happens. This is where, this is where life on Earth happens. So make, it, make a connection with it and do what you can talk about it, communicate with people about it. I, I do have a question. Why, why is it, what type of ship is this? 
<laughs> Originally, or what did it become? <laughs> That's the moment, it's a Viking ship. It's a Viking ship. It's a Viking ship. And is there a specific reason why a Viking ship was chosen? <laughs> um, because it sets really on nice. fire really well. We've actually got <laughs> yeah, a clip it's now. Hilarious, but it's also Funeral. the Norwegian influence. Yes. We wanted to make a little we made a The Vikings are from Norway. Yeah. So well, all of the north. Um, but we wanted to hold a funeral for the, pa the Paris Climate Agreement, so it's kind of a, a rather a classic thing, the Viking burial, so past the burning ship, but also um, the chairman of the IMO is Norwegian, so it's like this connection there. It brings to my head, obviously the Vikings did lots of conquering. They did? Well, Viking is a verb. It's to Viking, uh -huh. they're the Norse people, but they Vikinged, um, which was traveling the world and exploring. They did quite a lot of stealing as well, which was very nice. But yeah. Thank you so much, Sophie. We're just going to go to a bur the burning of the Viking ship now, where we took a clip of this earlier. So you should now be watching that. Um, and we will catch up um, with all of our rebels in just a second. Now, if you're watching this, this was the scene outside the IMO earlier today, where a flag raising the name on top of it says Paris Climate Agreement. The reason for that is because if these uh, the reason we're all here, of course, is because there's a meeting going on tomorrow um, and it's running until the 20th. And if the proposal, the new proposal, goes ahead and is adopted by countries, it means that the Paris Agreement will be absolutely unattainable. Now, if you're wondering, what on earth? Like, how is that, how is that the case? Well, at the moment, the shipping industry emits over 1 billion tonnes of CO2 a year, and that's likely to increase and will increase with these proposals. This is huge, as at the moment, shipping carries around 80% of global trade so as that grows, so does that number. Now, if you're watching this and you're wondering, how on earth do I get involved? I'm seeing these, these videos that you're showing me of these burning, uh, these burning ships. I don't want this to be the future for, for me, my children, or anybody around, which it very much is for a lot of people right now. We heard from people experiencing the Picasso oil spill, the ninth oil spill of this year. We've learned about the science behind it. We've learned about the people suffering first and foremost. If you want to get involved, there's all sorts of things that you can do. You don't have to be part of Extinction Rebellion. There's loads of different organizations that are pulling together on this to try and make an impact and trying to say, no, please do not do this. We need to put pressure on the right people to say this cannot happen for the future of us all. But if you do want to find out more about how you can get involved with, Extinct with Ocean Rebellion, we're going to show you a clip now of exactly how you can do that. I'm going to show you this, this boat just behind me here. Our ocean habitats are unique in the solar system that support around one million species of animals. This is too precious to lose. Oceans produce over 70% of the oxygen we breathe and absorb millions of tons of carbon dioxide. They regulate our climates with their currents. If we look back at the five mass extinctions in Earth's history, four of them were caused by disturbances to the global carbon system. Burning fossil fuels is changing the ocean's chemistry more rapidly than at any time. At a rate which is probably ten times greater than any of these mass extinctions or any of the smaller extinctions that we've seen on the planet Earth. Stop the destruction. Clean up the mess. Do we want to end like this? Because the sea is rising, we will rise. Because the coral is fading, we will fight. As the seas are mined, we will mobilize. While the oceans are suffering, we will protest. Don't let our ecosystems die. Hello everyone, you are back outside the MIMO, that's the International Maritime Organization here in London, the site um, of a group who are organizing a very important meeting, um, going, it's a summit going on to tomorrow and for the next three days, um, and that will decide really the future for 
our planet when it comes to the Paris Agreement. It would be totally unsustainable to be able to follow um, the, the agreement that's been put in place if this goes ahead. Now in front of us here today we have the wonderful Adil and we also have Jules. Um, they represent two wonderful countries <laughs> uh, in Mauritius and also Panama, um, which we've spoken about earlier in regards to the Wakashio oil spill and they're going to be having a conversation now. So first I thought maybe you could, if you could both introduce yourself that would be wonderful and explain a bit about where you come from in regards to this argument and conversation. For sure. My name is Adil. Um, I've campaigned for the planet uh, for decades now and um, I'm part of Ocean Rebellion which is the sister arm of uh, Extinction Rebellion and um, Wakashio broke my heart. It's been a hundred days now since what I've shown truck off short. And it's still the fuel into our business. In those hundred days we've had ten questions that have not been answered. And those ten questions have now caused a problem in my country among the people. The frustration and the anger has now forced them to fight against each other. We need to get behind our government to put pressure on Panama. France and the IMO and Japan to get the answers to these questions. A hundred dolphins, uh, sorry, nearly almost a hundred dolphins um, have died. We've got coral reefs, coral reefs that are never going to be um, And there's kind of fish. Exactly, the livelihood. So in terms of uh, livelihood. And we've also got issues where we've got um, there's so much to go on here. Um, we've got a lot of issues. And the problem is none of this is being resolved. In the meantime, I was waiting for all the questions and these answers. What cash can get us in a nature reserve, which makes it even worse. <coughs> the nature reserve of Inule Gret and Blue Bay Marine Park. Um, are home to some of the most endangered species on the planet. Lizards, reptiles, the green turtle. And these, these are not just going to, they, these are not just going to go, you know, suddenly be restored to the, the way it was. But Wakasho has fast forwarded global climate change on my country by at least 15 to 20 years. Mauritius needs to realise that we are thinking about the current, but we need to think about the future of the children. You know, hydro hydrocarbons are going to in are going to cause problems in terms of increased cases of cancer. It's going to cause problems in terms of liver disease. It's going to cause problems in reproductive systems of the children in the future. There's a lot more to Wakasho than meets the eye. And in the meantime, while we're focusing our, our attention uh, in other places, we should be asking the question of what is the root cause of our anger? And now come together to ask those questions and, and work together with organizations like, like, like Ocean Rebellion, Extinction Rebellion, Greenpeace. We need to, we need to find the answers. George represents Panama. Absolutely. Jules, if you could explain a bit about your perspective on all of this, because Panama, believe it or not, actually has a big controlling part to play in the IMO at the moment. Yes, well, I'm Jules. I'm from Panama, born and raised over there. I've made my way over here to the UK with my British family, my British wife, my British kids. And to know that my country, the flag of my country, is being used for corporations that don't have borders to destroy our shared home fills me with rage. That's no other than sadness. If it was my country, my hometown, I can is an island in the Caribbean. If it was my hometown that saw oil spilling over its coral reef, that saw my fellow countrymen not being able to fish anymore that babies were going to be born with abnormalities and defects from the cancerous substances that are, fine, that are found in that oil, I would be really angry. And that's exactly what's happening because an IMO 
decisions are made by delegates. And Panama has a fleet of over 6,000 ships. Obviously, this has an historical reason because of the Panama Canal. Uh, in fact, the U.S. decided to sell alcohol on a ship during Prohibition. You know, Al Capone and all that stuff? When alcohol was prohibited, they said, let's put Let's sell alcohol in a flag that's different from the U.S. So that's sort of how flags of convenience started. Then in the Cold War, the Marshall Islands, who is amongst the delegates that are asking for carbon emissions to be reduced, also did it. So we have a system that unfortunately isn't preserving life. Our current economical system worldwide isn't about well-being of people and planet. That's the root word of economy. It's to take care of the home, our shared home. But the economy right now is destroying it. So we need a whole reframing and there's many frameworks. You've got circle economies, you've got donor economics, you've got the growth, transition towns. The ideas are already out there. But what's in the way? Big corporations, vested interest, and the politicians who for decades have known this. 30 years ago, when the IPCC report spelled it out clearly, governments had a chance to act little by little. And that chance is gone. We need dramatic and drastic changes. The disasters like Wakashu that happened in Mauritius, it's not the first one. And the sea crew who are out there, Panama, just increase the amount of months that the sea crew can spend out there. 17 months, who wants to spend so much time away from your family, from your home? Now, Telius, which is a maritime organization, has compared these work environments as slavery. Obviously, they're not, but it's compared. It's really bad. It's not good. We're in the 21st century. We have plenty abundance on this earth for everyone to live in harmony. But instead, we are pushed to get in all these vehicles to make a livelihood. We are pushed to consume all these products with advertising. You mentioned plants. It's the Paris Agreement. And Macron, he just had a citizen's assembly over in France, and they came up with over 160 proposals. And Macron already scrapped several of them that had to do with banning unnecessary advertising, that had to do with restricting flights that weren't necessary. You know, so why are the politicians not listening to the science? Why are the delegates not listening to the science? And when we take it, I think it's important to say, we, we take it from the big things like why the delegates, why the politicians, why the countries? But really it comes down to the people you mentioned. The Marshall Islands earlier, Those are gonna, that's going to be one of those countries that's expected to be underwater within the next uh, couple of decades. That's huge. Mauritius is also going to be one of those places that's going to be affected hugely by rising and rising water. This is enormous and all those shipping vessels, frankly, they move straight past all of these really important places. They, it's not the first time that these shipping vessels has been in a place like Wakashio. It's not been like Panama has absolutely been affected by the climate crisis. All of these places have got huge, huge issues. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to the people that have very little to do, really, uh, on a first terms basis with the consequence, with what's ha what is causing these problems. And it's them that are feeling the consequences. Um, I wanted to ask you, obviously, you're, you're from two, representing two different countries that are linked in this way. I wanted to, to see if you had any, any. Uh, you already said that you felt that, Jules, that you felt embarrassed almost that pa Panama has, has got such a filthy hand to play in this. Um, and from your perspective, you were saying that, you know, it's not, it's not Jules's fault. It's about the bigger picture. Um, how do you feel like you can uh, use your power as individuals from these countries to really have your voice amplified and, and to make a bigger change in this picture. Um, that's the, one of the last questions I want to ask before I want to see Adil ask the questions I know you wanted to um, of the, uh, to, to the IMO. Um, and I wanted you to, to ask those to the camera and then we'll go over to somebody in Mauritius. 
But first, I wanted to ask that question. How do you feel like, as, as two people representative of two very important countries in this shipping conversation, shipping, if you're tuning in, causes around 1 billion tonnes of, uh, of uh, carbon pollution every uh, year. This is enormous. And this is causing huge issues that we should all be caring about because ultimately it's everyone's future. So I'll let uh, maybe Jules, if you want to lead with that, and then I'll go to Adil, and then Adil will go to the questions. Well, to, to my people in Panama, to my friends and family, to my friends, I would say there's no Panama Canal on this current trajectory. So voting to keep business as usual is not good for the economy of our country. When I was in Panama, I saw coral bleaching. There's a huge amount of people who depend on the fish to eat. There's no corals, there's no fish. I also saw sea levels rising. So Panama, you should get on board with lots of other countries that are small ailing island nations that are putting pressure on the bigger neo-colonial countries who are dictating our future and destroying our future and destroying their own. What I try to do as an individual is spread awareness amongst friends and family via messaging apps, via my own social media, by writing. And obviously, as an ecological activist, I've been rebelling on the streets with Extinction Rebellion since April of 2019, because for many years I had completely lost hope. I knew what was happening, but I didn't know anyone that was doing something about it and came along Extinction Rebellion with a solid theory to change things, rooted in history, in the rights that we've gained, in the big changes. Here in the UK, you talk about the suffragettes. In Panama, for example, we talk about regaining our sover sovereignty from the US government that took a strip of land off us to build a Panama Canal and have military bases. And people rose up and we got our freedom back. So go and do your studies, find out what works, find your people, and love, rage, rebel, and revolt. Because that's what we need to achieve system change. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jules. That's brilliant, brilliant. Now we're going to go over from Jules uh, to Adil, who, as I said, is outside the International Maritime Organization with something to say um, as a person with important Mauritian heritage a country that is facing the very forefront of the failings of the shipping industry right now, where an oil spill has devastated an already struggling ecosystem. I'll pass you over to a deal now. We, the Mauritian people demand answers. We want answers to questions, and these are the questions. We want to know why a satellite track vessel of 300 meters in length, 300,000 uh, 300, tons in weight, was allowed to enter our territory and along the innocent passage and allowed to crash onto our reef. We also want to know why the ship's captain's statement of why he sailed into our, into our territory and crashed on a reef keeps changing every fortnight. We want to know what else the vessel was carrying. There were small boats circling around the cash shop before it, you know, as it hit our shore and as it approached. We want to know why the vessel was allowed to sit two weeks stuck on our reef and allowed to break up and spill oil. Despite insurances in the first week, there would be no chance of this happening. We want to know why 70 plus dolphins turn up on our shores dead or dying. We are still waiting for their post-mortem reports. Despite pre-post-mortem reports telling us that this had nothing to do with the oil spill. We want to know what type of vessel, uh, what type of fuel this vessel was carrying. A fingerprint test takes a day to complete. What are we dealing with here? What is the poss What is there possibly to hide? Why were the Mauritian volunteers of all communities and backgrounds helping with the cleanup forced away on the second week of the, uh, of, the of the cleanup operation, and the area was made a restricted zone? Why, despite Greenpeace warning and a petition of almost one million signatures, did France and Japan insist on trawling the, uh, 
the larger part of Wakasha and taking it and, and sinking it in a tidal current facing Reunion Island. As that ship degrades, it's logic that that metal poison is going to pollute the sea further. If the sea dies, we die. We also want to know how the cleanup is progressing. We have very little updates on what's going on. We also want to know who is responsible for the cleanup operation. We want to know what is the level of compensation due to my people and my country. How it, will that help us look after those families on the southern coastline, uh, support them, and also how can it help us to rebuild our country? We want to know why the stern of the vessel is still stuck on our reef. We are wondering why there are so many foreign experts that came to assist at the early days and they turned their backs on the operation. We want to know so many things about, you know, those 10 questions are causing chaos in my country. And in the meantime, while there's anger and rage among the people, they've actually turned on our government. They've actually turned on our government. And what our, my message to our people is, is to come together. Come together as a nation and stand up to the French, the Panamanians, Japan, and definitely the IMO. Thank you very much, Adil. Thank you, that's fantastic. Now, everybody who's watching here, this today, we are, for the final time, I'm going to tell you, we're outside of the IMO, the International Maritime Organization. These are the people responsible for hosting a summit that's going to be starting tomorrow and is going to run until the 20th of November. Within that summit, we will find out the outcome of whether or not a proposal has been accepted by um, the countries involved in implementing that. If that happens, if that is accepted, it will change the future for our seas and for the Paris Agreement. It will not be possible to reach, to pre prevent a more than two degrees rise by 2050 if this goes ahead. You'll see scenes now from earlier today where uh, the Paris Agreement was being burned as part of a demonstration to show the consequences of these proposals being accepted. And you heard as well today from a wonderful Malaysian person, a, a, a wonderful Mauritian person, sorry, um, in a country which is currently being um, ravaged by an oil spill the 9th of this year, showing that already disastrous consequences as our, as our shipping industry as it is before any considerations of, uh, of the consequences of worse and greater shipping. Um, issues uh, are raised. Now I'm by myself uh, here now at the Maritime, well, I'm actually with Jules, Jules is just behind me, um, and we're going to go now um, to our final voice of the day, which is over in Mauritius. Um, one Adil Roe kindly put us in contact with some people who are involved in the cleanup in Mauritius, and um, there's thousands and thousands of tons of oil been spilled there. It's causing absolute environmental collapse in that area where we're already on a global scale in the last 40 years alone seen 68% um, of the world's wildlife vanish and um, these sorts of things cause devastating consequences and it is at the hands of the shipping industry so if there's a time to put a spotlight on that it's absolutely right now so as you're joining us here please spread the message send this video to five people that are watching we're going to be sending we're going to be adding links as to how you can get involved as well in the comments um, and we're going to leave you now with um, a wonderful man called Ruben Pelé in Mauritius. He is uh, one of the people who has been documenting what's happening over there. He's one of the people who has been on the forefront of the action against um, these awful, awful um, consequences of shipping industry inadequacies at the moment. So if you're watching it, please enjoy this uh, video, um, but do realize that the seriousness of this that if we don't make these changes and stop the proposal from being accepted in this committee summit that's happening tomorrow and over the next three days we're likely to see a lot more issues like this not only due to the extreme conditions 
of the climate crisis, but also due to shipping vessels going into uncharted territory and frankly not being regulated to a point that allows them to be safe. There is some solutions and this is certainly not one of them and we can all add pressure there. So now I'm going to pass you over to Ruben Pillay from us here in London outside the International Maritime Organization. Let's put pressure on them together. Thank you very much. Très amis, bonjour. C'est avec beaucoup de tristesse que, et de colère que je vous présente les, les images de la catastrophe écologique que nous sommes en train de, de vivre aujourd'hui à l'île Maurice, avec euh, le déversement du, du pétrole dans le lagon à, sur la côte est de l'île. Friends, it's with much sadness and anger that I'm presenting you with the images from the oil spillage caused by the shipwreck of the Wakashio on the eastern coast of Mauritius. The ship has been here for more than 12 days and the anger is because we did nothing. Nothing was done to pump the fuel out and today we're faced with an ecological catastrophe that my country will take years to recover from. Donc, euh, la colère est, est, est à cause du fait que ce bateau est là depuis plus de 12 jours et rien n'a été fait pour pomper le, le pétrole de ce bateau-là euh, pendant tout ce temps et jusqu'à en fait, jusqu la veille de, du désastre, on nous disait, les autorités nous disaient qu'il n'y avait pas de risque. Même quand le bateau commençait à prendre l'eau et qu'il s'affaissait, qu'on voyait qu'il était incliné, on nous disait que les images avaient été euh, manipulées. Donc la population est en colère, nous sommes en colère, et aujourd'hui nous devons payer les pots cassés d'une certaine incompétence. So, up until the very day where the fuel leaked out of a major gap hole in the hull of the ship, we, we were being told here that uh, there was no risk of uh, any oil spillage. And... Even when, when the ship started to sink at the rear, uh, having taken in water, we were still being told that the images that we're seeing, well, they're, they're, they're doctored. So, and then the, next, the very next day after those statements, uh, the, 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 the ship spewed its, its venom all over the, the place. And now we're going to have to live with that. And now uh, the, the SMF, uh, brave men who are going to put their lives on the line because it's a risky business to, do, to deal with oil like this and clean up. And you'll see at the end of the video how, how many men are involved in the cleanup operations. And these men are going to be faced with a, with a daunting task in the coming months. I'm hoping it's just months and not years. And not to mention that it's just a portion of the ship's fuel that's leaked out. There's 3,800 tons of, carb of fuel in there. And uh, if, the, is, if everything leaks, we're doomed as a touristic destination. It's un unthinkable. Donc, ce que je disais, c'est que le, le bateau contient 3,800 tonnes de fuel et que ce n'est qu'une infime partie de, de, de ce fuel-là qui s'est répandu dans les eaux. Et s'il si, arrive que le reste s'éparpille aussi, sorte du bateau, on est mal barré, hein, comme une destination touristique, c'est mal parti. Alors, donc voilà, voilà pourquoi la colère, voilà pourquoi la colère devant l'inaction euh, des autorités. Là, je tiens, je tiens à vous à repasser pour mes compatriotes mauriciens une vidéo que j'ai faite le 27 juillet, il y a 11 jours de cela, où je disais ce qu'il fallait faire, ce qu'il faudrait faire, qu'il qu ne fallait pas attendre que... Euh, le propriétaire du bateau prenne contact avec son assurance, qu'il fallait, nous, l'île Maurice, qu'il fallait qu'on prenne les choses en main, qu'il fallait qu'on qu pompe le, le fuel, qu'on qu affrète un, un deuxième bateau et que ça se fasse au plus vite possible et non pas attendre que euh, l'armateur ou l'assurance de l'armateur rentre en jeu. Donc, so what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to run a video that I did live on the 27th of, of July where I clearly stated that uh, we needed to act. We, the government should not wait for the um, owner of the ship 
or or, it's, or the insurance company of the owner of the ship to come into play that we needed to to come forward and take steps immediately to save our country, save our, our coast, save our tourism. And we see that 12 days have passed and they're only now looking at partnership with other countries to, to help uh, in this situation. And that's, that's why the people are angry. So let's start this video now. But it's, it's going to be in Creole, my local language. Nous peut trouver que dès l'eau fin rentre dans la cale des moteurs, d'après un article qui peut paraître sur, le, sur les journaux. Alors, me pensez le gouvernement besoin agir vite pour éviter une catastrophe écologique à l'île Maurice. Nous peut trouver que manière le pays euh, peut subir par rapport au Covid euh, et au tourisme, qui nous pas peut cave, euh, nous demande l'hôtel pas de travail et tout bande affaires touristiques n'a pas de travail. Donc, nous connaissons qu'il a peine le pays a été quand il a un problème avec le tourisme à, à Maurice. Alors, si il a un oil spillage, dans euh, la côte est avec sa bateau là les cas pas pour rester la côte est hein, ça, ça dépend qui grandit au spillage qui peut non et ça peut affecter tourisme à Maurice pendant des années alors il est impératif que euh, le ministère de l'environnement pr prenne bonne mesure pour qu'il empêche sa oil spillage là et non pas faut pas qu'ils bien dire là faut pas qu'ils attendent que l'armateur prenne ses responsabilités faut des pas qu'ils attendent que l'assurance de l'armateur euh, rentre en jeu me penser il arrive le moment pour qui Maurice lui-même lui prenne les, les mesures nécessaires quitte à faire rembourser les dépenses à de par l'armateur après avec autres l'assurance ou whatever this is for après mais là, pour l'instant, ce qui le gouvernement bise faire, c'est que le ministre bise faire, c'est les bise prendre les devants, n'a pas attendre personne else rentre là-dedans pour sauver nous la côte. Alors, moi, l'idée qui me fait gagner, me pas how feasible it is, c'est à, à eux de voir, d'analyser, mais me tiens content qu'ils tag le ministre dans sa vidéo là, et tout le monde qui connaît un advisor ou, euh, ou ban ban dimun se contacte le premier ministre même dans sa vidéo là ou forward ça ban là pour qu'il ban là fini comprend et fini dire pas venir dire après je parti connais alors solution qui moi me suis proposé c'est que le gouvernement lui-même il y a fret and container ship pareil un braquet pareil comment ça dans là je te fais living le plus près possible avec euh, le wakashio quitte à à tasli avec ban euh, tugboat pour qu'il y pas tassé que de ban tuck boss là, qu'à dire, il se bien. Et là, là, à l'aide de, de ban, de ban, euh, tuyau, pompage, je pompe des affaires. Je pompe tout le fuel, les 3800 tonnes de fuel qu'il y a. Alors là, ça qui est bizarre, c'est bizarre, amène un, un lot container chez pareil. Transfer avec ban tuyau de, de pompage. Transfer fuel depuis, euh, Wakashio à sa lot de bateau là. Et aussi transfer des lots qui contaminé avec fuel qui fait une rente dans euh, la cale, la cale du, des, des moteurs. Transfère ça dans une autre, dans une autre euh, section du bateau, vous même connaît comment ça peut faire. Hein? And then, take it away. Léa là, quand tout correct, Léa là, ce grave à any salvage rescue, or whatever. Mais, vous dire, il ne faut pas que le gouvernement attende que l'armateur, ou soit que l'assurance de l'armateur rentre en jeu là. Nous besoin agir rapidement, dépense quand c'était casse qui bizarre. Donc alors voilà, pour finir, euh, un grand bravo, un grand merci à tout le personnel, tous les volontaires et tous les, les, les membres de, de la SMF, qui est la Special Mobile Force, l'équivalent de notre euh, armée ici. Un grand merci à eux qui sont en train de risquer leur vie, parce qu'il y, y a plein de conditions qui peuvent être associées à, à, à travailler avec le fuel comme ça, et c'est négatif pour la santé, et ils, ils vont devoir tremper dedans pendant, pendant euh, des mois. So thank you to the members of the Special Mobile Force who are going to risk their lives in the coming months to, to clean up the country. And, and thank you as well to all the volunteers who are getting organized all around the island. There are people who are building um, boys to absorb the fuel. People are donating hair. People are, are uh, using uh, straw from the sugarcane fields, uh, dried, dried leaves. And... Uh, People are really getting together and starting to get organized here. Les gens aussi sont en train de s'organiser, les volontaires, ils sont en train de donner leurs cheveux, ils sont en train de fabriquer des filets, des bouées pour absorber le fuel. Et tout le monde est en train d'essayer de, de donner un, un, un coup de main pour mettre la main à la pâte et essayer de, de sortir de cette situation-là. Donc, euh, voilà. I have a question for Mauritians living on the island. 
if I mention the word biodiversity, the first thought that reaches your mind is likely to be thoughts about plants, animals, and microorganisms. An important part that we tend to forget is us humans and how we are an important part of an element of the broader picture. Since July, as answers to these questions have not been forthcoming, Mauritius, normally a unique multicultural population living in harmony, have now turned that rage of unanswered questions onto each other and onto our government. The disharmony has led to a rise in disobedience, protestations, bullying by ethnicity. This is actually a battle of those bottom feeders facing the disaster on their doorsteps and asking for help to be recognized and survive. Those in the middle of society don't know whether to surrender or to succeed. And those at the top are fighting for their ancestral privileges and rights of existence. This is exactly the same battle the plants, microorganisms and animals are going through since Wakasha. We need to stop and understand this. What we are experiencing socially has never occurred in the past on the island and its effects will be long lasting. We are hurting. What we Mauritians all need to understand is that our government has been managed like a puppy by the IMO since the 24th of July. Every decision not to answer public questions and the slow response to the action taken in regards to Wakasho and the oil spill is by France, Japan and the IMO, not our Prime Minister and his team of advisors. I now ask all activists dividing our community to stop, listen and act. Stop with that rage towards one another and now channel the anger within your various groups and focus it in the right direction. Get behind our government and help them put pressure on France, Japan, Panama and most importantly the IMO. For the Mauritian diaspora living abroad, get off your keyboards and Zoom meets. Stop being led by egos and trivial battles for things like the right to vote from abroad, raising awareness of singular species facing extinction, or crowdfunding for those already living in poverty before Wakasho. We are not going to be able to replace the dead coral, no matter what any conservative NGO spins to say. Even if we do, climate change and rising sea temperatures will kill the new. It's like putting money in a bin. That money should go directly to those who need it right now. There have been millions of rupees already donated by caring people across the world. What is the point of reaching out to help, to help the coastline children and their families in the current, when in the future, many of these children will be affected by an increase of cancer, liver disease, and potential damage to their reproductive systems, all brought on by the Wakasho oil spill. The fast forward button of climate change has been pressed on our island by 15 to 20 years. Now is the time for us to come together for the right reasons. If indeed you love your country and your families back home, protest and petition to your, uh, your local French, uh, Panamanian and Japanese embassies until we get all these answers that we require. We have lost three months in bickering and the need for, we need to support our government and it's urgent. Support Ocean Rebellion, Extinction Rebellion in its causes. Gain inspiration for campaign for the same reasons. The IMO, the IMO, the IMO, the wake up. Vous êtes contrôle du gouvernement et nos médias. Est-ce que nous avons l'esprit mouton? Nous avons une seule révolution, une seule solution.